next speaker is a new addition, so you may not have him on your schedule. But I just met him backstage, and he is a true delight. His name is Chris Rapley. He is professor of climate science at the University. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, at University College London, and he is a climate science communicator. So I think you are really going to enjoy him. I know that I do. So, my friends, Chris Rapley. Good afternoon, everybody. I, f- I find myself here in, in a slightly strange role. I originally trained as a physicist. Uh, very much as an experimental physicist. I I came from a family of engineers. My grandfather was an engineer, my father was an engineer. And so the early years of my research was spent building instruments to fly on rockets and satellites to open up new windows on the universe. And then after after a while, it struck me that you could turn those satellites over and build clever instruments to study the planet. And at that time, it was just beginning to become obvious that we might have a little bit of a problem with climate change, and particular its effect on the oceans and the polar regions. And so we built instruments to study those parts of the planet. So fast forward to the present, and I find myself in a very different position. I find myself here as a storyteller. And the story that I'm telling is a drama. And arguably, it's the greatest drama in human history. And I, and you, and all of the other 7.8 billion people on the planet are the actors in this drama. And so we need to understand a little bit about what that drama is about. So, it's not only humans that can tell stories, but the world around us can tell stories. And these stones, this one here, is on the river Elba in the Czech Republic. It's telling us a story. It's called a hunger stone. And at various points in history over the last 500 years, it has been revealed at times when the river has been exceptionally low due to a major drought and associated with it, a major famine. And so the inscription on this stone says, if you can see me, weep. So there have been many times in European history and history around the world where there have been extreme droughts which have had big social implications for human beings. But at present, it's not just the river Elba, The Rhine, in part, is so low that its role as a major artery for transport across Europe has been destabilized. If we look at uh, the Danube in Budapest, or the Loire, this is a tributary of the Loire in central France, or this lake in California, or the Piranha, in South America, the longest river in South America, or if we look in Asia, or if we look in China, we see the same thing. Extraordinary levels of drought, extraordinary low levels of water in the rivers, and all of the associated problems. And so over recent months, in July, months ago, we had this extraordinary heat wave over Europe. It had followed an extraordinary heat wave over China and Asia. And if we pull back, we can see that all around the world, we're seeing simultaneous heat waves. So in history, we've had heat waves here, heat waves there. They've done regional damage. But never have we seen these exceptional heat waves simultaneously around the world. So what is going on? Well, the media, the newspapers and the television media are increasingly telling us this story. The planet is sending us messages. Those messages five, ten years ago weren't breaking through, but the media are now beginning on a daily basis to tell us 
that things aren't going very well, things aren't uh, good. World's rivers and canals turning to dust. Colorado River uh, in such a state that legal action has to be taken uh, to support uh, the communities and peoples that are being affected by it. Dangerous heat waves in China, US, and Europe. Heat wave in China is the most severe ever recorded. And yet at the same time, strangely, it seems, we see massive floods. As we speak, a third of Pakistan is flooded. 30 million people are affected. A thousand people died a few weeks ago in major floods. And so the media are picking this up as well. Uh, and of course, it's not just in Asia, in, in Mississippi there are floods. These are happening simultaneously too. So you ask yourself, wait a minute, how does that work? We have drought, and now we also have these extreme floods. So, so what is going on? Well, a little bit of uh, 19th century physics helps us understand. And that is that a warmer atmosphere can carry more moisture. And that does two things. It makes the atmosphere more effective at drawing moisture out of the land and vegetation, and therefore creating droughts. But it also carries more water in the atmosphere to the point where the warm air meets cold air, and at that point, more intense rainfall occurs in more limited areas. So you get this flash flooding, which then meets very baked ground, which it can run over, and you begin to get these floods. In addition, of course, glaciers are melting in Pakistan. Part of the problem is that glaciers are melting and more water is coming down to the lowlands from the glaciers. So this is what we all know. We, if we read the newspapers, if we watch the TV, this is what we know on a daily basis, that the, the, the planet is sending signals and saying, excuse me, things aren't going too well for you guys. I mean, because the planet is fine. It doesn't care. Uh, it's indifferent, but, but we do care. So what has the science community got to say about this? Well, for, since 1988, an institution set up by the UN, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been gathering the information that the climate change community around the world has been working at and synthesizing it into reports which are delivered to the governments of the world. And last November, Working Group 1, which looks at the physical state of the climate system, delivered its sixth report, and it said, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, the icy part, biosphere, the living part, have occurred. And then shortly afterwards, another working group that looks at the mitigation of climate change said, it is now or never if we want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, uh, which is the aim that was agreed to by the nations of the world in 2015 in Paris, if we wish to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees without immediate and deep emission reductions across all sectors, it will be impossible. So we're getting to the point where it's not just the social world that limits our ability to meet these goals, but it's the physical world, the physics, chemistry, and biology of the planet say, excuse me, there are certain things you cannot violate. If you leave it much later, you cannot meet this goal. And, and some of my colleagues would argue that we are already through that uh, tipping point, that barrier. And Antonio Guterres, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, summarized all of this work, the thousands and thousands of uh, papers and uh, refereed uh, journal publications that have been brought together into this synthesis. And in a world in which slogans often have a bigger impact than all of that evidence, he said, this is code red. This is code red for humanity. Pay attention. So, so what's going on? As, as a physicist, I like to understand, you know, what's, what's underneath all of this. And, and the most, at the most fundamental level, what we have done, uh, not, not intentionally, as you heard uh, earlier on, uh, it's an unintended consequence, of, is it an unintended consequence of our using fossil fuels to generate the wonderful modern world which we all enjoy and benefit from, is that we have upset the energy balance of the planet. The planet intercepts uh, heat and light from the sun. That heat is used uh, because it's a heat engine, it drives the motions of the ocean and the atmosphere. It, it supports, uh, it drives the biosphere upon which we all rely. Photosynthesis is essential for life on Earth. 
And then that heat is radiated away back into space, into the darkness of space. And over the long history of the planet, that balance, the incoming heat and the incoming energy and the outgoing energy, have been in almost perfect balance for many, many decimal places. But by industriously pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we have increased the greenhouse gas content of the atmosphere, and some of that heat is finding it more difficult to escape. It's struggling to do so. It's done so by convection and radiation. And at present, as we speak, the planet is accumulating energy as if every single person on the planet had 40 one and a half kilowatt electric kettles running continuously, pouring hot water into the ocean. That's the scale of what's going on. And, and that's not a bad analogy because 94% of that energy imbalance is going into the ocean. We don't live in the ocean. The creatures of the ocean know it. The corals know it. The biota know it. But we don't live in the ocean, so we don't see that. We feel the 2% that's going into the atmosphere, the 2% that's going into the land, and vicariously the 2% that's going into the ice. Just again, to put it in context, the energy imbalance is 20 times the energy that humans generate on a daily basis to run the modern world. So anything where, you, where you're using energy to do something and you're causing an unintended consequence which is 20 times greater, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that that probably isn't a very smart thing to do. Now this image um, is not the one that you're used to seeing, this beautiful blue jewel hanging in the darkness of space, this wonderful little spaceship that we all occupy. This is a very old image taken from a satellite uh, 30 years ago uh, in the infrared, and it's a negative, um, and so the um, uh, areas that are whitish are cool, cold, these are higher altitude, rather cool clouds, and the dark areas are what in the optical we would call the clear atmosphere. But in those dark areas you cannot see the continents. If, if they were clear, you would. And so this is a wonderful direct demonstration of the greenhouse effect, this thing that we heard about, John Tyndall discovered in 1850, whatever it was, that these very tiny uh, quantities of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen compounds, and particularly the water vapor, cause the atmosphere to be opaque in the infrared. If you had infrared eyes, you would not be able to see the stars in this wavelength range. And we have added carbon dioxide now we have added more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than the natural change in the cycle between an ice age and an interglacial, when the global temperature changes by about five degrees. And we've done it so quickly that the planet is still responding to it. This huge complex system, is, the, the effects are rippling through the system. So as that energy accumulates, the world warms, ice and snow melt, Sea levels rise because the ocean warms and expands, and also it's receiving water from the ice sheets and the glaciers on land. Ocean and atmospheric circulation patterns change because the temperature difference between the equator and the pole is changing, and it's that temperature difference that drives the motions of the fluids. The water cycle accelerates, as I just said, 7% more uh, water vapor in the air if it's warmed by a degree centigrade. Extreme weather events increase. Ecosystems respond, food and water supplies are affected, infrastructure that was designed for the climate system that we inherited, not the one that we're provoking, uh, are either damaged or require expensive upgrading. People and species are impacted. And that leads to economic and political stability being affected too. So climate change is a threat multiplier that feeds into all of the other problems that the world has and makes them worse. Now, I've, I've told this as if it's a linear cascade, but this is a hugely complex system with all sorts of interacting positive and negative uh, amplifications. And so actually, the, the effects are rippling up and down and sideways through the system. And the human brain is not very well, uh, it hasn't evolved to understand how complex systems work. We think in linear ways. We think in cause and effect. So a ball moves, somebody must have kicked it. In this system, all sorts of uh, peculiar and a counterintuitive things can occur, and the only way that we can deal with these is through using computer models as a tool to try and understand what is going on. But the consequences are manifest. I won't take you in any detail through this, but we start top left with melting ice sheets, methane release, intensified hurricanes doing damage, floods, 
The, the next panel is worth looking at, the flaming, telegra- uh, flaming electricity post. Who would have expected? I didn't hear any of my uh, climate science colleagues predict five years ago that PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, electricity, the utility that supplies energy to California, the richest state in the richest nation of the world, would be bankrupt. It is technically bankrupt because some of its equipment ignited some of the worst wildfires in 2018-2019, and the class action of the 80,000 people who lost homes and properties, and in many cases lives, against them, requires that they find $13.5 billion of compensation, and so they are bankrupt. Who would have expected that? And then we go on round, uh, coastal erosion, the buckling of infrastructure not designed for this, French power stations being closed down because the cooling water is too hot to cool the uh, power station. And bottom left, migration. Migration, we know, is an extremely tricky issue. It has destabilized European politics over the last uh, 10 years, and it will continue to destabilize politics worldwide. So there are consequences. And this is not new, it's not a surprise. Uh, The US military and security services in 2014 published a document that said, rising global temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, climbing sea levels, and more extreme weather events will intensify the challenges of global instability, hunger, poverty, and conflict. Now, the only thing that has changed in those uh, eight years is the tense of the verb. So it's not will intensify, it's are intensifying. So it's happening around us uh, as I speak. What do we need to do? Absolutely clear. We need to leave 90% of known coal reserves, 60% of known oil reserves, and 60% of known gas reserves in the ground. We cannot burn them. If we burn them, the science tells us that we will violate those limits of 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees. We know that we have to leave them there. And so it's an insult to all of us that the oil and gas companies are still exploring for more resources. We know they cannot burn what they already have access to if we are to meet those Paris goals. And we hear a lot about uh, net zero, where somehow or another with magical technology, we will manage to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at the same rate that we're pumping it into the atmosphere in 2050, uh, technologies that we know that know don't exist. From my personal point of view, I say the, the abolitionists in the 19th century, the 18th century and 19th century didn't say, well, do you know what? will reduce slavery by 50% by 1810, and any, any residual slavery left over in 1830 will offset by prayer. They said, no, it's an abomination, we will abolish it. So my strong message is, leave it in the ground, abolish fossil fuels, and we have to have an adult conversation about how we go from where we are to where we need to be. Nobody wanted to be here. We've all benefited from this. It wasn't intentional. But now that we know that there's a problem, we need an adult conversation to do something about it. So where do we stand? This thermometer um, is a little bit complicated diagram, but it's basically a thermometer that shows the warming world. So what the nations of the world agreed in Paris, this diplomatic triumph, was that we would strive not to exceed two degrees of average warming. Remember that the land warms up more than the ocean, and some parts of the land warm up even more. So so that two degrees is just an average. In some places it's four degrees, other places it's less. So that little area of 1.5 to 2 is the target zone, the yellow target zone. We started here, pre-industrial. This is where we are now, 1.2 degrees. And, And already look at what we are seeing. Where are we headed? Well, the best guesses, based on all of the promises that have been made uh, by the political world and by what we see happening in the business world, there's a lot of wonderful work going on, uh, the sort of thing that we heard earlier, but the best guess, the best estimate, is that we're going to end up at about 2.4 degrees unless we accelerate the, the scale and pace of what we are doing. And imagine, this is a non-linear system, Imagine that what we will see at 2.4 degrees if we get there, compared with what we're seeing now. Well, I'm asked a lot of the time, how do we know? How how are we sure about this? This is really serious stuff. So how do we know about it? Well, there there are lots and lots of ways, but I use two illustrations, which I find that most people are unaware of. For the last decade or more, the nations of the world, the scientific 
uh, nations of the world have been seeding the ocean with floats. You can see one in yellow on the uh, right-hand side of the diagram. And so throughout the world's ocean, there are nearly 4,000 floats. They cost about $20,000 each, cost about $20,000 a year to operate them and take their data. And these floats are very smart. They sink at least to two kilometers, some sink deeper. They take measurements of uh, temperature and pressure. And of course, they move as, uh, as the ocean currents carry them. And then after 10 days, they pop up and a passing satellite gathers the data from them and then they sink down and carry on. So that's one way, and I said 94% of the energy is going into the ocean, so this is a very important part of the system, and this system sees the warming, it sees the energy, sees the temperature rise in the ocean, consistent with that, uh, uh, that energy imbalance that I talked about earlier. Um, but uh, coming from a, a rocket science, space science community, of course the other way that we study how the planet works as a whole, um, we're all familiar with the word microscope. It allows big creatures like us to study things that are very small. Years ago, we tried to get people to adopt the word macroscope, which allows the satellites allow little things like us to study the large thing, the planet. Macroscope didn't uh, take off, but anyway, you get the idea. Currently orbiting around us, there are dozens of satellites. These are the ones launched by the European Space Agency, but we have NASA, we have all of the other nations, one way or another, launching satellites. Armenia is about to uh, launch, it, launch its own satellite, I understand. And these are all continuously, each of these costs probably half a billion dollars or euros, and they are delivering terabytes of data to us all the time. So, why is it so we've got all of this evidence? Why is our response so inadequate? Well, it all comes down to these things. Every one of us was equipped with one of these things, the Mark I Paleolithic brain when we were born. And it's a remarkable instru in instrument. It, 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 the analogy of uh, a, a supercomputer and the way a supercomputer works doesn't, isn't quite valid. But essentially, this is an exaflop computer. So it's doing a million, million, million floating point operations a second, and it does it all of the time. It operates on 20 watts and weighs 1.3 kilos. The most powerful computer in the world at present is Frontier. Uh, it weighs 290 tons and it uses 20 megawatts of power. So, you know, you've got a pretty smart object here. The iPod is brilliant. I love it. I've got my iPhone with me. But the human brain is pretty amazing. But it has all sorts of flaws. And Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, likened our Mark I Paleolithic brain to a machine for jumping to conclusions. We live in the instant. This is what evolution has found is the best solution for us to navigate the physical world in which we find ourselves and the social world, both of which are dangerous, but the social world is more dangerous than the physical world in many ways. And so constantly, we're making 30,000 decisions a day and constantly we are intuitively deciding how to manage the world around us to gain benefit and to avoid disbenefit. And so what is influencing those, those decisions, many of which are just habitual, most of which are intuitive, relatively few of which engage the reasoning part of our brain, which is just a small piece of it. So our evolutionary history, individual genetic factors, memories and experiences, physical sensations, emotions and mood, pressures from the social environment with us social animals. I wouldn't dare say something in here that might offend lots of people, so that, that's a taboo subject. Uh, influences from cultural heritage, drive, emotions. We have feelings. Somebody tells us something and there is a surge of emotion. Maybe it's anger, maybe it's laughter, uh, maybe it's fear. So those mental associations drive decisions and actions and all too often that stimulus triggers this kachunk response, the parallel response. These sensations drive action and they jump the rational thought process. I did an experiment this morning in a talk I was giving where I got people to react quickly to a question and they all got the, or well, they usually, in this case it wasn't quite so clear, but most people get the wrong answer because it's better to quickly get the wrong answer than to slowly get the right answer unless you're given permission. If I had said, blah, 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 tell me the answer and think about it, then the reasoning part of the system could have kicked in. So when people say climate change, there is an instant psychological reaction, and often it is fear, often it is guilt, often it is a feeling of helplessness. And one of the problems with the climate change community, of which I am one, 
is that we have never been taught the psychology of how you tell a story in a way that goes with the grain of the audience and helps them overcome these negative emotions and channels that energy into a positive reaction, an optimistic reaction, say, you know what, let's have an adult conversation, let's move forward. So there's the personal psychological barriers that have to be overcome, but then there's the institutional barriers, which may be organizational, but also many of them are psychological, that it is simply not possible to discuss the unthinkable in organizations. And because of that, we find that there are many organizations that want to do something about climate change. They want to join the growing band of people that are doing things about climate change, but they're stuck. And so my neuroscience colleague, with who I've been working for some years now, and the group of people that we gathered around us, there are marketeers, they're narrative specialists, they're anthropologists, they're psychologists, they're socio-psychologists. So as a, as a natural scientist, I'm way, way, way outside the boundary of my normal uh, training. They have looked at the body of work over 50 years of, uh, of mind science work, and they have said, this is interesting, and that's interesting, and this is useful. We've come up with seven insights, which I don't have time to take you through now, but I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. And these, my, my neuroscience colleague said, these are the laws of the way the human mind works. I, I have to say, as a physicist, I don't think Newton would have been quite comfortable with these being laws. And, you know, human beings are a little bit more plastic and valuable than that. But they are hugely valuable insights, one of which is that the linear model is wrong. It is not evidence that drives beliefs and action, it's actions that drive beliefs. It's exactly the opposite of what most of us, children of the Enlightenment, have come to believe. And so we have set up an action unit. We said we're not going to publish any more papers that five people in the world understand and get shoved into an, a digital, dusty, electronic library somewhere. We're going to go out there and we're going to change the world. And we have set up a unit that enters into the domain of society and reaction to climate change and action in, in, in for it. We find protagonists for stuff. Um, uh, uh, communities of place, communities of style, communities of, uh, of learning that are stuck, want to do something and want to change. And we use these insights to work with them and indeed bring in other experts who they need to, we decide they need to work with get inside their heads and figure out, well, what are the psychological and institutional barriers that are making you stuck? And, and, and out of this becomes, in the end, an agency, the ability to do something. And it's proving to be very successful. We're creating the agency to act. Uh, there are lots of examples. We're doing this. We're choosing targets in society where they have a hand on a lever that will have big action rather than minor action, so governments, uh, senior civil servants, uh, organizations and institutions that have a real influence on the way society operates, local government, national institutions, and what have you, and we're having growing success. So I said at the beginning that I was talking about a drama, and the good news is that the last chapters of this drama are not yet written, and the good news is that all of you, all of us, can be the writers. Your job is to write what goes on those empty pages. Your job is to write the future now, and don't write it in red, which is the color I've been using all along. Write it in green, which is the color of hope. Thank you.